That was a little bit about uh, NASA astronaut Anne McLean launching this morning. Uh, you can follow her journey at the uh, handle Astro Animal. Back in Baikonur, you're getting a look again at the uh, Mission Control Center over in Korolev, where uh, flight controllers there are working with flight controllers here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room, uh, monitoring today's launch. But of course, back in Baikonur, McLean is joined in the capsule today by Canadian Space Agency astronaut, engineer, and doctor, David St. Jacques. St. Jacques will be the first astronaut from the Canadian Canadian Space Agency to fly to space in six years, following the mission of Chris Hadfield. And these are big shoes to fill, uh, falling on the shoulders of, uh, of giants before me, uh, previous Canadian astronauts. So it's a great uh, privilege, a great honor, and also a great source of uh, humility and responsibility to, uh, to be the next one to represent uh, my proud nation up there. St. Jacques was selected for service in May of 2009 and moved to Houston as one of 14 members of the 20th NASA astronaut class. Prior to becoming an astronaut, St. Jacques was a medical doctor and the co-chief of medicine at a health center serving an Inuit community on the Hudson Bay. He has also worked as an adjunct professor at, and a clinical faculty lecturer at McGill University. Working internationally, St. Jock began his career as a biomedical engineer and has developed adaptive optics and inferometry systems for telescopes in Japan and Hawaii. His experience also includes engineering work in Hungary and medical training in Lebanon and Guatemala. Now as an astronaut poised to make his first space flight, St. Jock's journey has been supported all the way by his wife and three young children. Rounding out and commanding the Soyuz MS-11 crew is Russian cosmonaut and spaceflight veteran Oleg Kononenko. He was born in Charjow, Turkmenia, and graduated from the Kharkov Aviation Institute in 1988 as a mechanical engineer. He went on to work at the Central Design Bureau of the State Research and Development and Production Rocket and Space Center in Samara, Russia. There, on March 29, 1996, he was assigned as a test cosmonaut candidate. Kononenko blasted off into space for the first time in April of 2008 aboard the Soyuz TMA-12. He would follow that up with two more trips prior to this launch, logging a total of 533 days in space with three spacewalks so far. His most recent flight was in July of 2015, where he served as a member of the Expedition 44 and 45 crew. This year, he has performed backup duties for the previous two Soyuz crews. We're now under 50 minutes away from the launch of Expedition uh, 58 crew to the International Space Station. This mission launches under the call side Antares, chosen by the Soyuz MS-11 commander. Antares is the brightest star in the constellation Scorpion, can be dis distinguished in the night sky by its reddish tone, and is sometimes mistaken for Mars. As always, in honor of their mission, the Soyuz MS-11 crew has an official patch. This mission, the imagery represents the International Space Station paving the way for future deep space exploration. You can see the Soyuz headed to the space station, the horizon cutting across the middle and the red shape resembling the symbol of Roscosmos, all conveying the future exploration goals of the program and the international cooperation required to accomplish them. In keeping with another tradition installed in the Soyuz instrument panel during the crew's in-cabin pre-launch preparation activities uh, last week are zero-G indicators. Anne McLean tells us her son selected a baby dragon to accompany her on the trip. This dragon is uh, being hugged now by a surprise uh, special holiday elf, Christmas elf. As for St. Jock, he has um, his children to thank for his indicator. They decided to send uh, him to space with their shared favorite toy, raccoon. If we're able to watch these toys closely during Soyuz Ascent, we'll be able to uh, see them float when the capsule reaches weightlessness. Uh, what is the current uh, day or orbital module pressure? 
812 is the current threat or pressure. Copy, 812. Camera one is activated, racing the commander in wood and flight engineers. And uh, we still have uh, 40 minutes remaining prior to launch. And uh, Antares, if uh, you'd like, you can just go ahead and uh, play your music. You're getting a live look at the Soyuz MS-11 craft. Uh, you can see the clamshell gantry tower still on um, uh, around the capsule. Now we're getting some uh, B-roll from earlier today. The crew awakened about 8.31 p.m. Central Time evening, um, Sunday evening, 8.31 a.m. local time in Baikonur. This is nine hours prior to launch. Crew members then participated in the final pre-launch activities. Before departing for the launch pad, the three crew members observed a long-standing tradition of autographing the doors of the Cosmonaut Hotel in Baikonur, Kazakhstan. After the priest blessing around 11.30 p.m. Central Time on Sunday night, uh, 11.30 a.m. Monday morning in Baikonur, the crew departed the Cosmonaut Hotel and boarded the bus for the ride to the integration and suit-up facility. This is building 254 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. many of the friends and family and media that join this is the last uh, time they'll get this up close and personal to the three astronauts about their, to make their way to the International Space Station. Um, they made their way to building 254 from there media and friends and family can join again this time separated by a panel of glass. When they arrived each crew member underwent final uh, medical exams and then they suited up in what you're seeing here the Sokol launch and entry suits. The suits were then pressurized to ensure the integrity of their seals. Suiting up activities you're seeing now began around 1 a.m. Central Time this morning, 1 p.m. in Baikonur. This is about four and a half prior to launch, four and a half hours prior to launch. Thank you. 
After the suit-up activities, the trio moves to a room. Uh, they're now looking on to the friends and family. You can see them now behind a panel of glass. After the suit-up activities, this is where they begin the uh, pr uh, pressure test. The suits are, uh, the three astronauts get into a mock-up of one of the seats on the Soyuz vehicle and is uh, fully pressurized to check the integrity of the seal of the suit itself. After the crew members uh, verify that the suit uh, doesn't have any leaks, uh, they go undergo these leak checks. They have a chance to go up to one of the microphones in front of the glass and have the last few moments uh, to have a chat with their families. You can see Ole Kononenko, and here you see David St. Jacques chatting with his uh, family, again, three kids and his wife. Anna McLean now in the chair, undergoing her final set of uh, pressure checks. This again um, began around 1 uh, a.m. Central Time this morning, 1 p.m. in Baikonur. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hello. Hello Ian. Are you going somewhere? Oh, road trip. 
just a lot of fuel lifting you up, but some really beating hearts all the way. We're with you. You just saw European Space Agency astronaut Luca Parmitano, part of the backup crew. Good afternoon. Launched this morning. Glad, glad to see you. Ground teams are all ready to support you. Um, all things are ready for you on board Space Station. Have a great time on board Space Station. Enjoy your time. You'll be very busy. Find a little extra time to enjoy yourselves. Uh, take care of yourselves and take care of the Space Station for us. So work very hard to get where you are. You're, in, you're going to enter a very serious phase of, uh, of the operation, but remember you're also there to have fun. The eyes of the world will be upon you, and we hope to enjoy it as much as you do. Good luck and have fun. We'll share the fun. <laughs> You just saw some of the managers of Roscosmos and NASA give some final comments. This is their last, last chance uh, to do so behind the protective glass before they make their way out to the launch pad. A brisk but manageable uh, afternoon there in Baikonur, about 24 degrees Fahrenheit. About 2.30 a.m. Central Time, 2.30 p.m. in Baikonur, they made their way from building uh, 254 uh, out to the launch pad again at Site 1 at the Cosmodrome um, in the afternoon there in Baikonur this morning here U.S. time. This drive takes about 25 minutes. They arrived at the pad around uh, 2.56 a.m. Central Time, 2.56 uh, p.m. there in Baikonur. The same members from Site 254 meets them out here at the pad and escorts them to um, the stairs that bring them up uh, to the capsule while they're taking an elevator ride up the uh, clamshell gantry service towers.
You're looking at uh, some of the final uh, moments, the final wave before they actually make their way up the elevator and into the capsule. And there's that elevator ride again, making their way up to the very top where the Soyuz capsule is poised. Getting a live view now of the uh, Soyuz capsule clamshell gantry service towers that you just saw them ride up uh, just about two hours ago, now being retracted. We're now just over 31 minutes uh, before launch, scheduled again at 5.31 a.m. Central Time, 5.31 p.m. Local Time, over in Baikonur. We already know that today's launch will be the very first journey to space for NASA's Anne McLean, but there are a few things about her that you probably couldn't have guessed. Let's see what those are. Okay, one thing that most people don't know about me is that I've wanted to be an astronaut since I was three years old. That's when I first told my mom that I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, when I went off to preschool, I told her I was going to school to learn to be an astronaut. And when I was in uh, kindergarten, I wrote my first uh, very poorly written book on going to space on the Soyuz vehicle. Two. When I was in sixth grade, I had a birthday party and I asked every single one of my friends for a calculator uh, for my birthday. And I didn't tell my parents because I was too embarrassed, but uh, I got a lot of calculators and I was super nerdy about it. Uh, but one of the things that I learned was, uh, you know, you just gotta be yourself. Uh, I wanted a bunch of calculators, I got a bunch of calculators and that was okay. I was a huge nerd then and I'm still a total nerd now, but uh, hey, nerds get to go to space. Three. Another thing most people don't know about me is that I played rugby. Well, maybe if you're close to me, you probably know that because uh, I'm a little bit uh, crazy about rugby. And the last time that I played was about a week before I got selected here at NASA. I played in the English Premiership in England, and then I went back and I played on the U.S. national team. One of the things that I learned about uh, myself playing rugby that I apply every single day is when you think that you have given everything and you have nothing left to give physically and mentally, you have a reserve that you can dip into and you can just keep going. Four, four. I was a helicopter pilot in the Army. I flew helicopters for about 10 years before I became a test pilot. And uh, one of the things that I learned flying helicopters is that when something looks really risky from the outside, that people that are doing it on the inside, uh, they're not professional risk takers, but they're probably professional risk mitigators. Five. One summer, I watched the movie Top Gun so many times, probably three times a day for a matter of months, uh, that my brother finally took the tape out of the VHS and broke it over his leg so I could never watch it again. I was absolutely devastated, and so maybe it's partly his fault that I have to go uh, live that dream as a military pilot. Um, but uh, you know, you never know where you're gonna get inspiration from. And if you're inspired, well, then just keep doing it. Even if your brother says not to. That was a little bit about uh, NASA's Anne McLean, who's at the top of the Soyuz vehicle right now. You can see from this live shot over at Site 1 of the Baikonur Cosmodrome, the clamshell gantry towers fully retracted. You can see on both sides of the screen the green towers uh, completely horizontal at this point. Uh, one of the many milestones that we'll uh, be following until launch just 28 minutes from now. 
I'm Gary Jordan here at the International Space Station Flight Control Room over at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Teams behind me are monitoring today's launch, our go for launch, and are uh, communicating with the teams over at Mission Control Moscow uh, to monitor a safe launch of our three astronauts today. We'll be taking questions live throughout today's broadcast using the hashtag AskNASA on Twitter. We have a few questions coming in. We'll take one right now. Uh, this one comes from Trace, who's asking, how many astronauts can the International Space Space Station accommodate at one time? Well, uh, usually we're looking at about six astronauts, and that's what we're going to um, stock up on today. Six astronauts total on the International Space Station, three on board right now, three on their way. This is about a normal uh, handover period for the International Space Station, uh, but it can accommodate much more than that. Uh, the record that we have is actually back in 2009, as part of STS 119. There was 13 people on board the International Space Station for just a short period period of time. Again, you're watching the live coverage of the launch of NASA's Anne McLean, Canadian Space Agency astronaut David St. Jacques, and Oleg Koninenko of Roscosmos to the International Space Station, getting very close now. The launch pad service structures components have already been lowered and the clamshell gantry towers uh, have been retracted in preparation for liftoff. Suit, suit leak checks uh, once again are underway, this time inside the Soyuz cabin, and the emergency escape system has been armed. This escape tower would fire in the event of a problem during the launch. The system is designed to pull the spacecraft and the crew clear of the booster, enabling the Soyuz capsule to parachute to a safe landing in the event of an emergency during the launch or early stages of the, of the climb to orbit. As we get closer to launch, you'll see several other events unfold. At four minutes prior to launch, the combustion chamber nitrogen purge begins. At T-2 min minutes, 45 seconds, booster propellant tank pressurization takes place. The event continues as the first umbilical tower uh, is retracted at T-35 seconds and the second at T-15. At T minus 12, the launch command is issued, culminating a launch of the Soyuz spacecraft as the countdown clock reaches zero at 5.31 and 52 seconds a.m. Central Time, uh, 5.31.52 p.m. local time there in Baikonur. During the climb to orbit, tracking and telemetry from the Soyuz vehicle is downlinked to the ground stations along the flight path and is routed to the launch control blockhouse near the launch pad in Baikonur. And then to the Russian Mission Control Center outside of Moscow, again in Korolev, the, the view that you're seeing right now. And this flight is controlled from Baikonur until, until the shutdown of the third stage engine when it transitioned to the Russian Flight Control Center. Seconds after the Soyuz reaches orbit, the vehicle's command and control system will be activated. Stored computer commands will deploy navigation and communications antennas, and the solar arrays will be deployed to collect power for use by the onboard batteries. A couple stages after launch, of course, first stage shut down at a minute 58, uh, and then that first, the core stage continues as the second stage um, until shroud jettison and second shroud jettison just a few minutes later, and then uh, second stage shut down and jettison after that. That ignites the third stage. Uh, this is a hot fire where the third stage is ignited before the separation of that second stage, uh, part of um, the uh, ascent profile, the normal ascent profile. And the third stage shutdown and spacecraft separation uh, begins at 8 minutes 45 seconds um, until a preliminary orbital insertion just under 9 minutes. After the Soyuz reaches orbit again, the vehicle's command and control system will be activated. Stored computer commands will deploy navigation and communications antennas, and the solar arrays will be deployed to collect power for use by the onboard batteries to generate electricity for the Soyuz systems. The first antennas will be deployed, uh, though they're the KERS rendezvous and docking antennas, which will be used to provide automatic range and rate of closure information on the final approach of the Soyuz to docking with the Poisk module, again on the space-facing side of the International Space Station. 
After reaching orbit, the crew will oversee the programmed activation sequence of a variety of systems uh, just before the spacecraft passes out of range of Russian ground stations. Those systems include the spacecraft's power supply system, its radio communication system, and the critical mission motion control system. During the first orbit of today's flight, the Soyuz will automatically execute the first two of several orbital adjustment burns planned as the vehicle fine-tunes its path to the International Space Station. Getting live views of the Soyuz vehicle. Again, we're tracking a launch at 5.31 uh, a.m. Central Time today. This comes just uh, before a sunset over at Baikonur, uh, now scheduled for 6.04 p.m. local time there. You'll see the sky get a little bit towards those sunset's colors, as you can even see right now. Just under 22 minutes from launch, you can see the uh, umbilical towers there to the left of the vehicle. They'll be retracted just seconds before liftoff. That first umbilical tower towards the top of the vehicle, uh, over the, the shroud uh, that's covering the Soyuz vehicle right now, uh, will be retracted again at 35 seconds prior to launch. And that first umbilical tower that you can see sort of uh, towards the bottom uh, of that, actually close to the first stage uh, of the vehicle, that core stage, will be retracted just 15 seconds prior to liftoff. Andrews, this is Baikonur. The readiness is uh, 15 minutes copy. So you can reactivate it. That steam that you're seeing from the vehicle is the normal venting of oxygen. 14.15 on Argo, copy. Just about 19 minutes uh, from launch this morning. Today's launch will mark the 11th flight of the Soyuz Modernized, syst Modernized Systems, or MS series of the vehicle, why it's called MS-11 this morning. The Soyuz rocket stands 162 feet tall and weighs about uh, 680,000 pounds. Consists of the Soyuz MS-11 spacecraft inside the protective shroud that you can see there at the top, and the three-stage Soyuz FG booster below. And you can see the escape tower there uh, from this view out at the pad at Site 1. Spacecraft was mated to its booster and the three main engines were joined together last week. 
The entire rocket began its trek uh, to the launch pad just after 7 a.m. Baikonur time on Saturday, arriving less than two hours later, where it was raised to its vertical position uh, for the final pre-launch preparations. The Soyuz spacecraft, with its three crew members on board, sits high above the three stages of the Soyuz booster, which uses kerosene and liquid oxygen as the propellant. The first stage of the rocket has four liquid engines strapped to the side of the core vehicle. Each will burn for about one minute and 58 seconds before they drop away. Those four engines uh, work in tandem with the core engine. That core engine also serves as the second stage and continues to burn until four minutes and 57 seconds into the flight. There you can see the escape tower being jettisoned before those four strap-on boosters uh, fly away. Again, that core engine serves as the second stage. Uh, the shroud or the fairing at the very top is jettisoned and exposing the Soyuz vehicle to the vacuum of space. What you're seeing is the hot um, staging of the third stage uh, fires just before the actual second, separate, uh, second stage is, sep is separated. Has a, the third stage has a single engine that will ignite just before that separation, helps it to push it away, and will burn for about eight minutes, burn until eight minutes forty-five seconds into the flight. At that point, the Soyuz, the Soyuz will be in its preliminary orbit. Soyuz MS-11 spacecraft is scheduled to dock to the orbiting complex later today, after completing a fast track four orbit rendezvous. The planned one-day rendezvous will culminate with a docking to the International Space Station Poisk module. This is at the space-facing side of the International Space Station. We're looking at a docking time at 11.36 a.m. Central Time this morning, 11.36 p.m. in Baikonur, where Russian and American dignitaries, guests, and family will be watching the events unfold from a hotel not far from the launch site in Kazakhstan. This is Baikonur. This, once again, is a live look at the launch pad right now atop the rocket, and within the Soyuz MS-11 spacecraft again are NASA's Anne McLean, David St. Jacques of the Canadian Space Agency, and Oleg Kononenko of Roscosmos, now uh, under 16 minutes from launch. A little more about the Soyuz spacecraft. It's comprised of three modules, 23 and a half feet long, and weighs 15,700 pounds. Uh, the descent module in the middle is situated uh, in the middle of the Soyuz vehicle, contains customized seats for the crew members during launch, entry, and landing, and contains all of the controls and displays necessary for flight. It also contains life support systems, batteries for re-entry and landing, and the parachutes and soft landing rocket engines that slow the Soyuz down before touchdown when the Soyuz lands in Kazakhstan. There are eight hydrogen peroxide thrusters located on the module that are used to control the spacecraft's orientation or attitude during the descent until parachute deployment. It also has guidance, navigation, and control system to maneuver the vehicle during the descent phase of the mission. This descent module weighs over 6,000 pounds with a habitable volume of 141 cubic feet. Approximately 110 pounds of payload can be returned to Earth in this module. The descent module is the only portion of those three that you saw earlier that survives the return to Earth. You're seeing the hatch open to the top portion. This is the orbital module. Uh, connects the descent module via a pressurized hatch. It is where the crew has a small amount of room to move around during the flight to the International Space Station. Has a volume of 230 cubic feet with a docking mechanism hatch and rendezvous antenna located at the front end. The docking mechanism is used to dock with the space station and the hatch allows entry into the orbiting complex. The rendezvous antenna is used by the automated docking system, which uses radar to maneuver towards the station for docking, again scheduled six hours from launch. 
There is also a forward-looking window in the module that the crew can use to take manual measurements of distance and closing speed with a laser rangefinder in the event of failure of the rendezvous radar system. That last module in the back is the propulsion module, it houses the oxygen storage tanks, the main engine, the attitude control thrusters, avionics, and communication and control equipment. The propulsion portion of this module handles all orbital maneuvers, including those needed for the rendezvous with the space station and the deorbit burn at the end of the spacecraft's mission. Before they are deployed, the two solar arrays that you see there are folded against the body of the propulsion module, which separates from the descent module after the deorbit burn, along with the orbital module. The solar panels span almost 35 feet. The entire spacecraft serves not only as the crew transport vehicle to and from the station, but also serves as an emergency return vehicle in the event the crew should have to leave the station unexpectedly. Back at a live view of Site 1, uh, the pad, Soyuz, MS-11, all systems looking go so far on track for an on-time launch at 5.31 a.m. Central Time. A group of NASA representatives are there, is there in Baikonur, uh, ready to watch the launch uh, from just a short distance away from the launch pad. For an update on activities over there, we now go to NASA Public Affairs Officer Rob Navius. Gary, just seven and a half weeks have passed since that day in October when you were last here, the day of the Soyuz launch abort that denied two crew members a chance to reach the International Space Station and triggered a plethora of replanning by NASA, Roscosmos, and the rest of the international partnership. Today, at the start of what should be a December to remember, a multinational crew is poised to pick up where the last crew left off returning the station to a six-person crew capability for the next 17 days as the station program gets back on track. It was 22 below zero Fahrenheit in December 2012 when Chris Hatfield launched into space from here, the last time a Canadian astronaut flew into space. Not as bad today for David St. Jacques, but the temperatures will not hit the freezing mark here in the late afternoon, and it is a frosty day for the start of this six-and-a-half-month mission. A large throng of VIPs and family members are on hand today. NASA represented by Bill Gerstenmeyer, the Associate Administrator for Human Exploration Operations, Steve Jerzyk, NASA's Associate Administrator, and ISS Program Manager Kirk Shireman. The head of Roscosmos, Dmitry Rogozin, is here. And among the Canadian dignitaries on hand is royalty. Former astronaut Julie Payette is here. Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Julie Payette the Governor General of Canada, the Vice Regal Representative of the Canadian Monarch, who is none other than Queen Elizabeth II. Rockets and royalty in the Central Asian desert as we gear up for a crucial launch to the International Space Station. That's it from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Now back to you at Mission Control in Houston. That was uh, NASA Public Affairs Officer Rob Navius looking at the uh, spacecraft poised on Site 1 of the Baikonur Cosmodrome, ready for launch on time. As he has reported, everything's looking go uh, for an on-time launch at 5.31 a.m. Central Time. Again, a brisk day over there, about 24 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, just under negative 4 centigrade. We're getting in-cabin views. You're getting a live view of the astronauts inside the Soyuz spacecraft that's now currently on the launch pad at Site 1. Uh, over there on the left side of the screen, you can see in the right seat with the American flag on the left side of her arm is NASA astronaut Anne McLean. 
Above her is the zero G indicator, as um, explained before. The dragon was a it's a baby dragon chosen by her son, uh, being hugged by a Christmas elf. One of the two zero G indicators aboard. You can see Oleg Kononenko, the Soyuz commander, uh, flicking some switches as he undergoes the final steps before launch, just about 8 minutes 22 seconds uh, before liftoff today. He'll be the Soyuz commander, and to his left, just off screen, is Canadian Space Agency astronaut David St. Chuck. His zero G indicator, you can see the zero G indicator above Anne McLean, uh, the elf with the baby dragon. Uh, David St. Chuck's indicator is a raccoon chosen by his family. Getting good calls from uh, Mission Control over in Moscow. Everything's still looking good for an on-time liftoff today. Sun is slowly setting over in Baikonur. The sun uh, set for a um, sunset at 6:04 p.m. local time. There, we'll still be seeing the Soyuz liftoff during the daytime um, this morning, Central Time. Now under seven minutes, 30 seconds from launch. At this time, the gyros and the in-flight readiness and recorders have been activated. We'll be seeing a uh, series of other milestones as we reach the seven-minute mark. Uh, this is where the pre-launch operations are complete. Enter is the readiness is one minute. Copy all. Everything is nominal on board. We are ready. Everything goes per schedule. And uh, we uh, will be expecting your reports. And uh, please activate video camera that is located near the commander. Now getting uh, another in-cabin view, David St. Jock, you can see in the left seat, the zero-G indicator toy raccoon above him, chosen by his family. Now under seven minutes from launch, getting calls that all pre-launch operations are complete, everything looking good so far. At this point in the countdown, the Soyuz's first and second stage engines are ready for launch, and telemetry has been received from the rocket, indicating that all primary and backup systems are ready for launch. At the time of Soyuz launch, the International Space Station will be over central Kazakhstan, southwest of the capital of Astana, at an altitude of 252 statute miles. The space station will be 405 statute miles ahead of the Soyuz. Launch is precisely timed for the moment when the Earth's rotation will place the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the plane of the orbit of the International Space Station. Now 5 minutes, 30 seconds from launch. Again, a series of milestones following the pre-launch operations. The next will be when the launch key to be inserted. This is an actual key. Combustion chamber nitrogen perch. At this time, the uh, launch key has been inserted into the launch bucker. Yes, it, it's a real key. It transitions the launch sequence into automatic mode. Now just 4 minutes, 12 seconds from launch.
the road. On board measurement system is activated by RON 2 command. At this time, the onboard systems have been switched to onboard control. The commander's cockpit displays and controls have been activated, and the crew members are closing their helmets, which puts them on suit oxygen. Now just three minutes from launch. Booster propellant tank pressurization initiated. At this time, the fuel lines and other elements of the rocket engines are purged with nitrogen to fireproof them by removing the vapors of fuel and oxidizer. The booster tank is now being pressurized for flight. This optimizes the flow of fuel and helps to add structural support to the rocket. Now two minutes from launch. Less than one minute to launch, there'll be a series of other commands, and then you'll see those umbilical towers, there's two, uh, start retracting from the Soyuz vehicle prior to launch. Vehicle to internal power. Vehicle is now on internal power. You can see the first umbilical tower retracted. Auto sequence initiated. Auto sequence is initiated. That second tower now retracting. Ten seconds from launch. Second umbilical tower separate. Engines have started and are now at the preliminary thrust level, throttling up. Engines at maximum thrust, lift off. And lift off. We have lift off of Anne McLean to beat St. Jacques and Oleg Kononenko blasting through the Kazakh sky to the International Space Station. Copy. Everything looking good so far. Good first stage performance. Soyuz delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust. Copy. Everything is fine on board. 30 seconds into flight. All parameters are nominal. 30 seconds in, everything's still looking good. First stage will burn for two minutes, first two minutes and six seconds of the flight. The flight, uh, vehicle stabilization is steady. Copy. 50 seconds. Uh, chamber pressure is nominal. Everything looking good. Vehicle is stable. Good first stage performance. The ve uh, vehicle now traveling over 1,100 miles per hour. Seconds into flight. Everything is nominal. Uh, 
80 seconds, all parameters are nominal. Copy. Everything is... One minute, 30 seconds into the flight, everything's still looking good. The stage again will burn for the f for until 1 minute, 58 seconds into the flight, and you'll see those four strap-on boosters jettison. 100 seconds. Copy. One hundred and ten seconds. Escape Tower has been um, jettisoned, and those four strap bomb boosters also jettisoned. They've completed their job and will drop away at an altitude of twenty-eight miles. Confirm. Now transitioning to an animation, you can see from the launch pad losing sight of the Soyuz, but getting good for, um, second stage performance. Uh, we're feeling fine, and everything is excellent on, on board. Uh, copy, and uh, vehicle is stable. 150 seconds into flight. Second stage, this core stage, still performing uh, well. The launch shroud has been jettisoned, revealing the Soyuz underneath. Launch shroud jettisoned confirmed. This second stage will continue to burn until 4 minutes 43 seconds into the flight. 170 seconds into flight, all systems are operating nominally, copy. Everything looking good. This uh, second stage providing somewhere between 178,000 and 222,000 pounds of thrust. Seconds into flight, second stage uh, thrusters are operating nominally. Copy. Everything's still looking good. One minute left of this second stage. Right in the middle of the animation, you'll see a lattice structure. That will be where the third stage will start to burn, begin a hot staging technique, start burning before the end of the uh, second stage, and actually push that second stage away. Seconds into flight, beach your roll. Parameters are all nominal. Copy. Everything's still looking good. About 10 more seconds of this second stage burning. Hundred and eighty seconds into flight. Second stage separation confirmed. And we have confirmation of a good second stage separation. The third stage is lit. Will burn for about four minutes and two seconds, providing sixty-seven thousand pounds of thrust. Two hundred seconds. Three hundred seconds. Uh, Copy, and we're doing well. 310 seconds into flight, vehicle is steady. Five minutes, 30 seconds into the flight. We're in the third stage now. Everything's still looking good. Into flight. Third stage thrusters are operating nominally. The third stage will continue to burn until about uh, 8 minutes 45 seconds into the flight. Three hundred and fifty seconds into flight, everything is nominal. Uh, everything is excellent on board the Soyuz. The crew is doing well. Good reports from the crew on board. They're feeling well as the third stage continues to burn now six minutes and 15 seconds into the flight. Thank you. 
400 seconds into flight. Because civilization is fed. Copy. Seven minutes into the flight, everything's still looking good. Four hundred and thirty seconds into flight. All thrusters are operating nominally copy, and we're feeling well. Still getting good reports from the crew, feeling well as we're 7 minutes 30 seconds into the flight. The velocity now almost 13,500 miles per hour. Once the third stage delivers the Soyuz to orbit and the module is separated, a series of pre-programmed commands will be executed to prepare the Soyuz for orbital operations. These stored commands, called time-tagged commands, allow many of the Soyuz systems to be automatically activated by onboard computers at precise times stored in those computers. Eight minutes into the flight, everything's still looking good. Again, this third stage burns until eight minutes, 45 seconds. Four hundred and ninety seconds into flight, copy. Five hundred seconds into flight. Eight minutes, thirty seconds into the flight, still looking good. Fifteen more seconds until third stage cutoff and separation. Five hundred and twenty seconds. Third stage separation is confirmed. And we have confirmation of third stage separation. Single liquid fueled engine has shut down and dropped away at an altitude of 126 statute miles. Congre congratulations with the uh, Everything's still looking good. The third stage is performing an avoidance maneuver by opening a valve in its liquid oxygen tank. Thank you very much for your support. Antares, this is Moscow. And we have confirmation of the uh, spacecraft separation. So use capsule and crew safely in orbit. The spacecraft is automatically executing its pre-programmed commands to deploy the antennas and solar arrays. Stage separation and uh, uh, you are go to close RPW-1 and RPW-2 airflow regulators. Copy. It's in work. RPW-1 and 2 valves have been closed and uh, no issues with uh, the indicator panel. Copy. And please proceed to page 39. Yes, copy. We'll put it in work. And you can carefully start AKG. Monitoring the vehicle section. It has been initiated. Copy. TV activation command stand. Copy. Контролируйте прохождение РДР. Выбрал формат сближения. Please monitor uh, RDR, uh, enable dynamic mode. Uh, yes, copy, in work. First, second uh, set activation confirmed, copy, and uh, we are receiving the image now, copy. Uh, repress is deactivated now, copy. Uh, repress deactivated, and we're standing by for the first set of measurements. Repress is deactivated. 17-42-08-7-9-6-8-1-0. Crew now working through the many stages to uh, now that they are in orbit. Again, the uh, third stage separation uh, 
and cutoff is confirmed. Also confirmed uh, the deployment of the antennas and solar arrays crew working through the uh, steps to, um, after getting into this first orbit, uh, to ensure a safe flight to the International Space Station. Uh, as a fast track for orbit rendezvous, they'll arrive in just about six hours. Also got confirmation from commander aboard the International Space Station, uh, Alexander Gerst, who actually was able to see the launch and the third stage separation of the of the crew members as the International Space Station was flying right overhead uh, above the Baikonur Cosmodrome. About that time, the International Space Station was 252 statute miles over northeast China, um, now separated by 1,586 miles uh, between the International Space Station and the Soyuz. 18.026264. Control of the spacecraft will uh, continue to be monitored by Mission Control over in Moscow. Here's a live ca uh, balcony view there. Uh, control of the spacecraft will be overseen by that center just outside of Moscow. Check out the indicators and sends now. Set one, of course, is operated nominally. And uh, uh, EKV inhibit is confirmed. Copy. Antares, this compass will be over at 14.52. Please note down uh, the next uh, compass start time. 16.03 is the start time of the next compass. Yes, 16.03, and uh, it will be... Uh, over at 1626, 1626, yes, that's correct. And uh, you are going to activate and deactivate uh, com assets manually. Uh, copy, I confirm activation of uh, set one. And of course, uh, string one is operated nominally. Copy. And during the next compass, uh, we are going to do uh, manual control uh, checkout and test. Okay, maneuver. On Display is selected. Copy. And ECAV inhibit time uh, for the next orbit is as follows: 160600. 160600. Yes, correct. And this is page 45. Copy. And. Um, that's our time. A great launch of Anne McLean, David St. Jacques, and Oleg Kononenko, who are now in the pr their preliminary orbit, going through some of the steps uh, to make their way to the orbiting complex just six hours from now. Four orbits uh, around the Earth. The liftoff was right on time, 5.31 a.m. Central Time. We'll wait for some of those uh, launch replays. In the meantime, we're taking uh, questions using the hashtag AskNASA on Twitter. We've had a few come in during today's show. This one comes from Tran C2, asking how the International Space Station operational schedule has been shifted since October's incident, and when is the current crew expected to return to Earth? A lot of operations have happened since um, uh, Alexei Ovchunin of Roscosmos and Nick Haig of NASA uh, aborted their ascent to the International Space Station on October 11th. Uh, there's been some um, in investigations and collaboration between Roscosmos and NASA to shift the schedule just a little bit. Um, if you take a look at the International Space Station right now, there's actually four visiting vehicles uh, currently attached to the International Space Station. Two of them are the Russian Progress Vehicle that carry uh, crew supplies, as well as the uh, Northrop Grumman Cygnus 10 that's currently attached to the Nader port or the Earth-facing side of the Unity module. Also, you can see there the uh, Soyuz. MS-09 that carried the crew, the current crew aboard of uh, Serena Anand Chancellor, Alexander Gerst, and Sergei Prokopiev. A lot of these launches uh, were shifted around to ensure uh, the safe uh, delivery and continuation of continuous habitation of the International Space Station. The crew that just launched today is set to also dock today, uh, December 3rd. Uh, there will be six crew members on board the International Space Station until the crew of the MS-09 that you just saw there. Again, Anand Chancellor Gerst and Prokopiev are set to depart uh, December 19th, U.S. time, December 20th, uh, over in Kazakhstan. 
We have another question from Edion, who's asking why is NASA always using the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan for the launch to the International Space Station? The Soyuz vehicle that we just saw launched today is currently the only human-rated vehicle uh, that can provide transportation from Earth to the International Space Station. That is uh, true now, but come 2019, uh, we'll start looking at some uh, commercial crew launches, beginning with some test missions, starting with the SpaceX Crew Dragon and, of course, the Boeing Starliner, set to uh, conduct a series of test missions, some of which include sending crew to the International Space Station. And again, we can start looking forward to that next year. Keep sen thermal uh, sensors at the specified time. Copy. Antares and orbital parameters are as follows, 88.7, inclinations is 51.6, altitude. Getting some great questions from hashtag AsNASA as we wait for some of those replays to come in. You can see the um, launch of the uh, MS-11 crew launch once again. But in the meantime, keep sending in those good questions using the hashtag AsNASA. This one comes from Terry. How long does it take from launch time to boarding the International Space Station? Uh, you can check that out today. Again, launch was at uh, 5.31 a.m. Central Time. Our coverage for the docking of that vehicle to the International Space Station will begin at 10.30 a.m. Central Time, looking for a six-hour rendezvous to the station uh, at 11.36 a.m. Central Time. So we use MS-11 will be docking to the Poisk module, which is on the space-facing side. Shortly after, we'll uh, take a quick break and then come back on at 12.30 p.m. Central Time uh, to begin our hatch opening and welcome ceremony coverage. Uh, that hatch opening time is scheduled for just about 1.35 p.m. Central Time. Phenomenally, everything uh, has deployed. So when it's all said and done, uh, you're looking at about uh, eight hours from the time of launch to the time of opening the hatch and entering the International Space Station. It's confirmed at 14.58. Uh, so in attitude is confirmed. And one more question from uh, Sakura, who's asking how much time it takes uh, to complete all the necessary training required for life aboard the International Space Station. We'll take uh, Anne McLean, for example, who was selected as an astronaut uh, back in 2013. She was an astronaut candidate for the first few years of training, uh, going through some of those preliminary um, training steps like learning the International Space Station systems, some spacewalking techniques, wilderness uh, and survival training, and T-38 training. That takes about two years. Uh, she completed that training in July of 2015. She is the first astronaut of the 2013 class uh, to head towards the International Space Station. And this uh, comes just uh, f more than three years after completing her astronaut candidate training. You're watching the uh, last leg of our coverage for the launch of the Expedition 58 crew uh, aboard the MS-11 Soyuz spacecraft, consisting uh, from left to right in the lower graphic there of Anne McLean of NASA, Oleg Kononenko of Roscosmos, and David St. Jacques of the Canadian Space Agency. Launched on time today at 5.31 a.m. Central Time. Had a textbook launch uh, and insertion into orbit. 
are now coasting on their way to the International Space Station. Looking for a four-orbit rendezvous, this takes about six hours. You're getting a balcony view from uh, Mission Control Center over in Korolev, just uh, outside of Moscow. Uh, we're at the last leg of our uh, launch coverage for today, an on-time launch at 5.31 a.m. Central Time of Anne McLean, David St. Jacques, and Oleg Konyenko, currently in orbit and on their way to the International Space Station. Waiting for some launch uh, replay so you can see the launch once again, but in the meantime, keep sending in questions using the hashtag AskNASA. We have one from Rohit, who's asking, uh, will the present Expedition 57 crew return to Earth on this same MS-11 on December 19th? The crew of MS-11 will, um, uh, once they arrive uh, to the International Space Station, they'll uh, dock to the Poisk module. This is on the space-facing side. Uh, if you were looking at the International Space Station uh, right side up, it would be on the top. Uh, those three crew members would be um, taking their craft to and from the International Space Station. The current crew aboard now, uh, Serena Onan Chancellor, uh, Sergei Prokopiev, and Alexander Gers will take the Soyuz MS-09, currently uh, on the Rosvet module that you can see there on, the, on this graphic. Uh, there's five visiting vehicles you can see on the graphic Soyuz MS-11 at the top there currently on its way to the International Space Station but the uh, current crew will take the Soyuz MS-09 home on December 19th US time We have another question from uh, Shashwat, who's asking, if anything goes wrong uh, during docking, what can the crew of the International Space Station do? 
Uh, right now, the Soyuz vehicle is communicating with some of the ground stations, uh, for, uh, the Russian ground stations, and will switch over to uh, the TDRS tracking and data relay satellites as it orbits the Earth. Currently, the Soyuz and the International Space Station uh, over the Pacific Ocean. Once the Soyuz gets uh, a little bit closer to the International Space Station, very close to the docking time, it actually will be able com to communicate with the International Space Station. If anything were to go wrong, uh, the crew of the International Space Station on the Russian side of the space station can actually remotely take control of the Soyuz vehicle. Another uh, appropriate question coming from KT asking how the astronauts on the International Space Station spend holidays in space. Of course, early December, the first holiday coming up uh, for the crew will be uh, Christmas. Uh, currently on board the Soyuz is a zero-G indicator, the elf on the shelf, uh, currently hugging a baby dragon. This was an indicator that once uh, the, interna the uh, Soyuz uh, was inserted into the, uh, an orbit uh, around the Earth, uh, that would indicate that they were, in fact, in um, the in microgravity environment. Uh, the crew, once on board, uh, docking uh, just six hours from now, uh, already have a lot of their holiday items uh, on board. But a few more, um, including some food, will be on its way to the International Space Station starting tomorrow. The SpaceX uh, CRS-16 is scheduled to lift off uh, from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida tomorrow. On board will be uh, some of the holiday food, uh, including some fresh food uh, that will be delivered to the International Space Station on a two-day rendezvous, arriving uh, just two days later on December 6th. Again, we had a great liftoff uh, today of Anne McLean, David St. Jacques, and Oleg Kononenko currently in orbit uh, over the Pacific Ocean, chasing down the International Space Station on a four-orbit rendezvous. We have some replays for you so you can witness that launch, uh, that textbook launch again that we just um, saw 30 minutes ago.
a great launch of the uh, Soyuz MS-11 craft um, from the Baikonur Cosmodrome right on time at 5.31 a.m. Central Time today. Uh, before we wrap up, we're going to answer a few more questions using the hashtag AskNASA. Thank you for sending those in. Uh, this one comes in from Renee asking, uh, is this the first time that two females are at the International Space Station? Of course, Anne McLean is on the Soyuz MS-11 craft right now, chasing down the International Space Station, waiting for a rendezvous uh, in less than six hours. Currently on board is Serena Anand Chancellor. Uh, this will not be the first time the two females are at the International Space Station. The first time was actually over 30 years ago. Uh, during STS-41G, Catherine Sullivan and Sally Ride uh, were on board the um, STS-41G in uh, 1984. For the International Space Station, the record uh, was back in 2010. Four women uh, were um, on board the International Space Station during STS-131. Last question comes from Michael, uh, who's asking on behalf of his five-year-old Chloe, wants to know if the astronauts have their own bedroom. Uh, luckily for this mission, yes. Uh, there are six bedrooms on board the International Space Station, three of which are occupied right now by the Expedition 57 crew. There's just enough space for the three uh, members of the Soyuz MS-11 craft uh, to get their own space once they arrive on board. But of course, uh, back in 2009 during STS-119, there were 13 people aboard the International Space Station. Not everyone got their own bedroom. So once again, a successful launch of NASA's Anne McLean, uh, Canadian Space Agency astronaut David St. Jacques, and Oleg Kononenko, spaceflight veteran and commander of the Soyuz MS-11 craft, currently on their way to the International Space Station. Uh, launched successfully at 5.31 a.m. Central Time, a, a textbook climb into orbit, and it will be the fast-track rendezvous today, uh, looking for a docking time around 11.36 a.m. Central Time. You can join us throughout the day as we come back on for some of the coverage of the docking and the hatch opening and welcoming ceremony of the crew of the Soyuz MS-11. Starting with uh, video files of some of the post-launch activities, we'll come back on at 10.45 a.m. Uh, for the Soyuz MS-11 docking coverage. Docking itself is 11.35 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, at uh, 12.45 p.m., uh, hatch opening coverage will begin, scheduled for a hatch opening around 1.15 p.m. Eastern Time. The video file of the Soyuz MS-11 docking and hatch opening will start at 4 p.m., and uh, that will wrap up our coverage of the Soyuz activities today. A successful launch of the Soyuz MS-11 crew currently on track, uh, orbiting the Earth and chasing down the International Space Station for our arrival later today. That'll wrap up our coverage. This is Mission Control Houston.